So Christiana, those of you who knew Christiana, she, Christiana took another job. She no longer works for us. But Lori works for regulatory, and she is also a former professional photographer. So we have, so Lori is taking the pictures. I'm sorry, you are still a professional photographer. Uh, okay, Lori's still a professional photographer. And so we're happy that she's going to be able to help you take pictures of your food. Um, we're also building on the third floor. We have a big room up there that we are converting into a, into a studio right now. And so we'll have a photo studio. We'll have, it's, we're going to have a lot of things in there that's going to, you know, be able to help you. So if you ever need pictures taken, new products, repackaging, whatever, um, Lori's the one who'll be helping you with that. Okay, and, and so Nakoma and Lori both come make your way up. So there's a, well they're gonna explain to you what this is, but I'm just gonna tell you that Utah Zone today, for, for those of you who are here, and those of you that need to have this or would like to have one, we are going to, um, hand out paperwork so that you can get a good manufacturing practice certificate. Um, she'll explain more about that, but it's normally a $30 charge for that, but there, but we're waiving the fee, regulatory agreed to waive the fee for that so that you can you can have that if you'd like to. So, Lori, thank you. Yeah. About that. Okay, but first I have to take pictures. So everybody has to smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, notice <laughs> Right? <laughs> okay, so my name is Lori Hicks. This is Nicoma Ware. We both work down in regulatory. So your licensing and registration that you guys deal with, your inspections, that's, that's uh, some of what we do. Um, Nicoma is in charge of a program called CFS, which is a certificate of free sale. With a certificate of free sale, it allows you to sell products overseas things like that. Um, the GMP that we want to give you today is it's a good manufacturing practice certificate. They are signed by the director, they're notarized, and they have a gold state seal. So when you take that document with you and you say, hey, I've got a GMP from the state, they're going to go, okay, you're awesome. Okay? Because they know that you're in compliance, they know that you're following the laws, and that you know what you're doing. So it's just another tool for you to use along the path of all this other stuff that you have going on. But it's it's something that you want to become familiar with. I mean, let's say you do decide you're, you were going to sell 100 crates of these cookies to China. China's not going to let those in the door unless you have a certificate of free sell. So GMP is kind of where you're going to start. Everybody for coming in today, we're going to comp them for you. They're normally $30 each. So Nakoma has been handing out forms which, please ignore the bottom of the form. It was just an easy way for me to get your name, address, and phone number. So on the top, if you give me the name of your business, the location address, the certificate will always have the name of the business and the location. But I also need a mailing address if it's different so that I can get the document to you. The document will have the location address because that's where the product is being manufactured. So, obviously you don't want a GMP in your home. No. You don't want to worry about your home. Okay, so make sure you're writing on there business name, business location address, a mailing address, and a phone number in case there's something that we can't read. It is a legal document, so we don't want to get it wrong. If I misspell something, we have to do it all over again. Okay, lawyers will be like, this is not going to work because your name is spelled wrong. So please spell correctly, or legibly. Does anybody have questions? Uh, what if we use a co-packer? Then it's the co-packer that meets the GMP. Okay, great. So yeah, that's an excellent question. Because you, let's say you are Harry's House of Vitamins, and your co-packer is Genesis. If you want to sell on Amazon, Amazon requires you to have that GMP, but you yourself can't order it because you're not manufacturing the product. So then you would have to go to Genesis, who would come to us and order what we need. So definitely don't be afraid to call your co-packers or your manufacturers and say, hey, I need you to order me a GMP or a certificate of resale, depending on what you're doing. Any other questions? What's GMP stand for? Oh, general. Good manufacturing good, good, practice. Good practice. practice. There you go. And it basically just means that we, as the state, have gone in, inspected your facility, <coughs> and are, that you are in compliance with state law with regulations on, on what happens in your building. 
and that you passed your inspections. Is anybody else? So are you yes. going to come in for an audit to do that, or are you, how are you going to? Well, typically when you get registered, the inspectors will go in and inspect the facility, and then depending on the type of the facility, we'll determine the, the, how often they go in. So some places get inspected every six months, some it's every two years. Once you pass your inspections, then in our eyes, you're good to go ahead and have a certificate or a GOP. What we kind already of have an audit. Can we just provide that to you? You can use that. What kind of business? That's food manufacturing, but we have a GMP Package. audit. Right. Sure. Yes, yeah. so you're packaging it yourself. So yes, mm -hmm. then the inspectors would need to go in. It has, sending us an audit from another department or another division wouldn't work. It would have to be one of our food inspectors sure. going out to your location. Okay. Follow-up question. Sure. Uh, I noticed this warehouse on there. Mm -hmm. What if we store some at our house because that's the legal res uh, place in my business. Mm -hmm. and I do get the health inspected there. And that's okay because you're getting your information from your co-packer. So okay. who does your co-packing? Uh, Corner bees. Okay, so that's who's going to be on your GMP. Great. So yeah, whether you're if you're storing stuff at home, yeah. that's fine because the GMP is basically just the manufacturer that's doing awesome. the product. Okay, and one, one, Gary, go ahead. One, one last that question. Means that, uh, so we produce some of our product here in Erda mm -hmm. and some in Platteville, Colorado. Do you want the the address of the farm in, in Utah, obviously, right? Yes, yes, okay. just Utah. So okay. anything that's manufactured outside of Utah, we don't have any control over, right. so we can't provide any kind of legal documents. Any other questions? And then just to add to what they said, also make note of this, because there are great exporting opportunities right now. Um, if you'd like to know more about that, in January, February, we're going to be holding some um, classes on that and how to get ready for exporting if you're interested. But we have lots of, next year there's seven trade missions going to other parts of the country that you can uh, qualify for to go and, and, you know, essentially it's a trade show and promote your product with distributors. So just tuck that away. We'll be trying to have more uh, information about that so that if you're interested you can you can look at that option. And then the last thing I want to say is just see how cute these girls are. Regulatory <laughs> is friendly. <laughs> they are friendly. They're nice people. <laughs> Sometimes. Depends on the day of the week. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't, they are friendly in January. When is three now? Right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, okay. Well, thank okay. you guys. Else? Yeah, let's just, when you guys are done, um, if you'll just leave, make sure that you leave them on that back table. I'll take them down to these guys when. When you're after you fill that out, just leave it here. We'll get it to that. Can I get your contact info for pictures? Sure. Uh, I'm going to give you my email address. That's the best way to get a hold of me. It's Lori Hicks, spelled L O R I H I C K S, at utah.gov. I'll give you my direct extension as well. It is 801 538 7156. Okay, it's a simple can process. If you just, I'm sorry, can you repeat your email address? Yes, Lori Hicks, so it's L O R I H I C K S at utah.gov. And Utah is spelled out. We get that wrong. Okay, but yeah, simple process. If you send me an email, please understand that I don't know what your products are. So it's okay if you send me a snapshot, even if it's just from your phone, just to give me an idea of what it is. And I'll give you an example. So yesterday I photographed, um, it was a soothing warm hugs, where one of those like bags that you put in the microwave that you warm up and put on the, you know, the pain. And we ended up having a beautiful shoot, even though he didn't really know what he wanted, but because I knew what his product was ahead of time, I was able to prepare to bring in stuff. So if you send me an email, even if you're just sending me a snapshot from your cell phone of what the product is, and then a little bit of an idea, of what you want your image to look like. And Pinterest is fabulous. If you look at Pinterest, you can always get so many different ideas of what you want. Even the simplest of prop can make a difference in the picture. Okay? Tell me your number again. Yeah. <laughs> it's 801 538 7156. You're welcome. Thanks, okay. everyone. Okay. If you have more questions about anything um, in regards to a certificate or photography, just we'll we'll talk at the end. We can answer your questions. 
Okay, so now it's time to um, have these great folks. Mindy came in, Mindy Rich came in and spoke to me about a month ago um, from Associated just expressing their desire to help um, work with local and help to, um, oh, I'll let them tell you what they're going to do. But um, anyway, I really appreciated the visit. It was, it was great to have that connection. Um, and then, and I'm gonna, this is like the worst thing to ever do, but I did not, do, I didn't write down your exact titles. This is Jason Sokol, Mindy Rich. Mindy, what is your exact title? Um, so I'm a senior category manager with AFS. Um, I work mostly with like natural, organic, local, and I do manage a few center store categories as well. And then Jason? I'm a uh, director of marketing for Associated Good Stores. So I think we have the right people here. So, okay, I'm going to turn the time over to, to you guys. And do you have the uh, projector? Oh, do you have the projector? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jack, see, I told you, Jack knows everything. <laughs> Except for where the remote control is. Uh, sure. Yeah. Better for your... All right, so while, while we're getting this going, I'll just kind of explain a little bit more about how my role works at AFS. Um, so, um, I think, I'm not sure if everyone understands what category management is, but I work in procurement, um, and I work, I work with our teams wall to wall on, on this particular initiative. So about three years ago, um, AFS decided, this is totally not a strong suit. I got the presentation going on my computer. I'm like, okay, I'm stuck. <laughs> so, Can you talk louder? Yeah, I'll do, I'll do my best to project. Thank you for saying that. Whoever said talk louder, because I don't have a very loud voice. So if ever I go quiet again in the back, just please like interrupt me, let me know. Um, so about, about three years ago at AFS, we were like, hey, you know what? We've got these areas of where we can see the consumer is going that we want to make sure we're paying more attention to and do a more concentrated effort on making sure that we're relevant. And so in procurement specifically, they actually created a position, the one that I have now, which is focused on um, what we've developed an internal acronym for. It's called On Shelf. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of it. Probably not. It's kind of a mouthful if you don't use the acronym. It's organic, natural, specialty, healthy, ethnic, local foods. So it's like a pretty big umbrella, right? But it's where the it's where the ball is going. Right? It's where consumers are looking. It's where the growth is. Um, and so I work with our teams wall to wall and an advisory role. So. Um, I can be an initial contact point for you. I may not be the decision maker on your items, but I can get you in contact with the people in procurement that you can start to collaborate with a little bit and see if there's a good fit in any, in any sense, right? So I kind of started jumping into this, right? So that was kind of a shift for us. Um, I mentioned I do manage a few things directly myself. Those are coffee, tea, uh, vitamins, and lifestyle nutrition. So if you have anything that falls under under those, I'm I'm your person, right? Um, also, I should mention, you know, I'm in procurement, but that initiative really spans our organization. So it's something that we're trying to pay closer attention to, uh, make sure that we're developing appropriately. So. Um, I know I meant to bring another stack of business cards with me, and I failed to do it. Ivari has some, and then also, if you want, I didn't put my uh, email in this, but if you'd like to write down my email, it's msrich at afstores.com. And then I should also mention, at any point in this, that anybody has a question, please just don't hesitate to interrupt me, okay? Yes? One more time on the email, please. M, S is in Sam, rich at afstorage.com. Yeah. yeah. All right, so one thing that we've been working on developing 
Um, we have always kind of had a local section at our, at our food show, um, but it's been growing. So I know a few of you, a few of you have, have uh, had the opportunity to participate. So this is kind of a snapshot of what it looks like. You can see the produce emphasis right there, and then off to the side, it's you can just see kind of the corner of it is the beginning of the local area that really encompasses the rest of the departments within our store. So in the, in the past, we've kind of done it on like a by invitation basis. Um, I'm gonna coordinate with Lari on just exactly how it's going to work, but it's got a really prominent placement at our show. We, we're gonna be in the same hall we were in last year, right when you walk in, off on the right hand side is the local area. It, I don't know, did you, what did you think of the food show last year? It's always so it's um, it had a lot of traffic it was pretty encouraging so the opportunity really I think first and foremost um, is as a networking opportunity right like with each other but with our retailers so this past year we had over 330 of our retailers in attendance so it's a chance to get your products in front of these guys if there's like any kind of a DSD type opportunity, right? Where you can exchange information, see if there's a fit. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit later, but sometimes it might not be a fit to jump right into AFS, but it might make sense in a few specific stores, right? It's gotta be like a mutually beneficial opportunity where it's a good fit for them, it's a good fit for you, and you can grow your business together that way. So even if maybe there's somebody in Montana or Colorado or something and you can UPS your product to them, you know, this would be a place to start making those connections. Um, you can see the signage that um, we put that together for you. I mean, we do ask for the information from you, like a picture. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. I mean, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, anything super high quality, but it is, it is nice if it's, you know, not so pixelated when it gets blown up because you can see how big that is. That's like a five foot tall by um, two foot wide sign. So by the time it blows up, it, it can get a little bit pixelated. So, but anyway, you get a, um, we put a picture of you up there and then it, there's a little blurb underneath it that tells the story about kind of what your business is about. Um, I mentioned the prominent placement of the show and then, um, to have the opportunity to put out a demo table and have some storage space. So that's kind of how that local area works, yeah. The dates of the show? April 4th and 5th, this next year. And how much does it cost? We, so that's another big benefit. Um, obviously we can't fit everyone, and so I'm gonna coordinate with Laurie on exactly how to work it out, but we, we do not charge for that space. So the space, as well as the marketing, the demo tables, all that, it's, you know, we, that's one way we want to, we really want to collaborate and partner with you guys to show our support. Can I, yeah. just to jump in too, uh, the sampling piece, I mean, you, you know, I mean, it's encouraged, but I know in some cases it's not always feasible just from a cost standpoint. So that's, we've had people come before that are just simply there hounding out brochures about the company and talking about it. So just to keep that in mind. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Even if you want to put out like mock-ups yeah. that are not for sample, just so you can showcase your product, but not, you know, give everything away, that's totally fine. Sampling is absolutely not required. All right, so here's, here's just a couple more examples of what that area looks like. Um, you've got Robillano's there, the Flossage Turkey, the Giggles. <laughs> That's not the best picture ever. That's okay. You wouldn't have noticed All right, so I kind of touched on this a little bit before, you know, like with the food show kind of being a great networking opportunity. Sometimes, sometimes, and I've seen it happen both ways, where um, someone will come in and will be like, wow, this is amazing let's put it in our stores and it's something kind of out of the ordinary and if you grow too big too fast and it's not something a consumer is familiar with it can kind of be damaging to your business and that is not what we want to see happen for you guys so um i saw a puzzle i see some puzzled looks is that so what can happen is um so in category management say we bring it into the warehouse we order 300 pieces from you to get this product going and start distribution. We ship it out to all the stores. 
Um, sometimes if it's a well-known product, well-known brand, no problem, right? Like you've been out building it at farmer's markets, people know what it is. It's already DSD in tons of our stores. You're well established, it's doing great. We pull it in, it's just like a piece of cake. It keeps going, we promote it, we market it, it grows, right? We pull it in too quickly, we order 300 cases. It's everything you got to come up with those 300 cases and then, then we don't have that proper support network in place. The brand hasn't built well enough. It's not understood well enough by the consumer. It's not moving like it should, and we, we're accountable for those slots in the warehouse, right? So it's not what we want to do, but sometimes it gets discontinued. And that's what I mean by saying it can be really damaging for your business. So that's, that's absolutely not what we want to see happen. I think that's like worst case scenario, honestly. So by, by putting out opportunities like, hey, come to the food show, start networking, start getting that brand out there more, now you're probably already doing a lot of work on your own in farmer's markets and probably have products in other places, stores, things like that. Um, but, you know, if, if we can help with that, that's really what we want to do. So I'm going to give you a couple examples that we've had some success with in that front in the past. So how many of you guys are familiar with this? With the Cavalcanti Gusto, the Brazilian cheese bread? A couple of you? Okay. So working with Carlos, he's like, oh my gosh, his product's frozen, right? It's expensive to drive around. It's not it's not the best way to go about business, but sometimes it makes the most sense to build a brand. So we got him in touch with Lee's, got him in touch with Harmon's. Um, he was in our corporate stores. Uh, he was doing tons of demos, but we watched the sales and watched how the product was growing. I mean, Brazilian cheese bread is a good example of something that a lot of people aren't really familiar with. Great product, fantastic product. It eats well, it's gluten-free. Um, the people who try it love it, right? But if they don't know what it is, are they gonna pick it up off the shelf? So in that regard, it's like, okay, let's work together. Let's see what we can do to help you network. And even though DSD is maybe not the best route for something frozen, we can help you until you get your brand to a point where we can pull it into the warehouse. So that recently happened. We carry four SKUs. We have these three as well as a family size on that middle one, the traditional one. And we expect, we expect it to do really well. But we wanted to make sure that we didn't pull it in too quickly so that we wouldn't have to pull the plug on it. That's, that's absolutely, that's never our intention, right? I'm sorry, I'm new to this, what is DSD? Oh, direct store delivery. Yeah, thank you, that's a good question. If I do that, I mean, we are infamous at AFS. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> way too many acronyms, like we've talked about writing books about it. I think somebody did at one point, actually. But anyway, thank you. <laughs> you did it, yes, it happened. <laughs> um, all right, another case study. So how many of you are familiar with CAUSIT? The bath bombs and the, yeah, it's another great example of a phenomenal product. Um, started a direct store delivery DSD in our stores, just started selling like crazy, doing really, really well. Um, looked at it and said, you know, I don't think it's feasible for us to ship these big giant boxes out of our warehouse. It's so we got a smaller case pack because um, the type of product it is, of course, it'll disintegrate if you ship it in individually, right? So we worked out a way to work together built the business up with direct store delivery first and then worked out a way to have a little bit smaller case size and now we're shipping it out of our warehouse so it's just another another example of you know starting starting kind of from the ground and then working your way up um maybe what so there, there's that place where you're, you're doing dsd and you stretch yourself as far as you can for getting to the stores um does associated still offer yeah, thank you for asking that question, we do. Um, so we do have a cross-dock program. Um, there, there's a fee for shipping um, through, through the facility. On the, on the bottom end, it's like 650 a pallet. Um, and we can work through all those things. You, you do still have to go through procurement to get that set up. Um, so it's something where you're gonna have to have distribution avenues. Another opportunity, um, there are a couple local distributors, and we have a crosstalk set up with Smart Distribution. So if you wanted to work with Roxanne and her business, um, she, she can take advantage of that, and that reaches anywhere our trucks go, right? So, and also that's another good point where, um, so Roxanne, there's also on the dock, um, 
And there, there are a few more local distributors where if you're kind of at that place, to Larry's point, where you want to work with somebody but you're not quite to the point where you're ready for AFS, but you know, are having difficulty reaching all these points, where, I mean, you don't have time to drive the product around and manage your business, right? So there, there are a couple people like that that can kind of help bridge that space as well. So if, if you're a DSD and Associated accepts you to be within the warehouse and you're getting the margin as a DSD, does that margin change when you're in the warehouse? Does it increase? So um, the way it works with getting into the warehouse, whatever your raw cost is, whatever you've, you've figured out for yourself, mm -hmm. that's what you would quote. Okay. So, um, so um, if, if DSD, you're buying my product at $3, but then I go through your warehouse, my, are we adding to that, which would increase the price in the store? Warehouse, so warehouse distribution does have an internal markup. Okay. Um, we're not, we're not like a money-making warehouse. I mean, we are, but we're not. I've got to be careful how I put that. So we have, we have different cost structures. We're, let me back up a little bit. We're, we're a member-owned co-op. So all of our member stores own associated food stores. So when they, when they choose on how they want to purchase the products from us, they decide what markup they, they want to participate at. So there's, there are rebates built into these markups at full, at full markup that they will then pay in the cost of goods during the year and they'll get a rebate back at the end. Now there's also um, like a cost plus model where they pay just a teeny tiny markup that covers our, our internal costs, like just operating. So the trucks, the lights, the refrigeration, you know, um, the overhead just, um, and it's, it's relatively small. But to your point, and to answer your question, yes, there, there is a markup in there. It averages, for, for grocery, it averages about 7%. Um, if you're looking at like a personal care item, like uh, GMHPW, you're looking more around 13, 14. Um, the fresh side as well, like food, so like a produce or um, deli, bakery, things like that, they're a little bit higher as well. And some of that's just if you think about the nature of the products, right? You've got um, spoilage and things like that that are all built into that. So, but it does, um, to answer your question. Now, that said, it's a lot lower than if you were to go to a specialty distributor or even like a smaller local yeah, distributor. Yeah, you know, smart right? or something. Yeah, like smart or, um, you know, we have, a, we have a partnership with Kahi where we have a managed cost office system set up with them. And we, we've contractually negotiated those markups. Um, so it, they're, still, they're still small for what it is, but it is going to add a layer of cost to your product. Um, that said, um, honestly, up front, when you're first starting out, I would kind of recommend building in a little bit extra for yourself. Um, just so, what I, what I wouldn't do is kind of is try to take that out of your own pocket um, until you reach the scale that it makes sense, okay. you know. And that that's another reason why I think it's important for us to help you grow your business until you can get to that point where you have scalability. All right. So, um, just a little bit of nuts and bolts. Um, a lot of times when we say when one of our corporate stores, for example, and I should, I should clarify by saying um, these, these criteria apply specifically to our corporate stores if you were to be accepted as a DSD vendor. Our member stores have their own set of requirements that are probably going to be really, really similar. Um, and if you do start in our corporate stores and you want to go into our membership, if you say, oh, I've already you know, done all these requirements with AFS, then that member store can be like, oh, okay, well, AFS already went through the uh, efforts of making sure that you have liability insurance and a W-9 and your food safety certifications and, and all of those things. And so it's kind of a, an easier segue, I would say, in some cases. Um, but I won't, I won't speak for them in saying that they're gonna have the exact same requirements as um, you know, what one of our corporate stores would have. But these are the basics. So. The two million in liability with AFS as a certificate holder, your W-9 or your W-8. Um, we do have a DSD vendor agreement. 
that, that needs to, that would need to be signed, and then um, food safety documentation. Now I asked, I asked our uh, food safety team, and I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert on that end, but I did do just a little bit of fact finding before I came in. Your GMP may or may not um, qualify as the proper documentation. The reason I say that is that there are certain risk levels depending on whatever your product is, right? Um, so if, if our food safety team says, oh, that's kind of a high risk item, um, there, there are other resources that we can provide you to help you. It's not, it's not uh, what, a game stopper, let's say. And I'll get into that in just a minute. So what do we require for, for you to get yeah, This is one quick question. What's the number of corporate stores relative to member stores in aggregate? So we have 39 corporate stores. Um, and then in total, well, above and beyond that, it fluctuates, but we have, what, 410, 420 member stores on top of that. Um, it ranges, including the corporate stores, anywhere between 450 and 500 stores. It just kind of goes up and down. So is the DSD model generally approach corporate stores first and then work out toward the member stores? And if procurement is done on the corporate side, then you then help facilitate the introduction to buyers on the local mem member stores. Hard to segue it, but just wondering well, like how to approach it. Wanting to become a DSD vendor, do you start corporate and then fan out from there? You know, we um, you could. Um, We're still kind of working through like the, the operations touch points on the corporate store side. If you if you want to connect with me, I can put you in touch with who you would work with on our okay. corporate store team side. Um, but there are a few there are a few of our member stores that are really really vested in local. I would I would call out like um, the market at Park City, mm -hmm. and then what's like what's the uh, store? The store. <laughs> the store. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, those guys, those guys are probably good places to start if you're looking just to get your foot in the door, um, because that is such a huge focus for them, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to steer you away from the corporate stores. I'm just saying, if you say to start with the corporate stores and then branch out, um, <coughs> I would say start maybe with those guys. Get in touch with the corporate stores. We'll see if there's a good opportunity there. But don't, don't let that be like if you don't get in there, don't that, let that be your stopping point. If you do go there and it's a no, then we can put you in touch with Lee's or Harmon's or um, Ridley's or we can help you network from there, you know, put you in touch with more stores. And I'm sorry, I just wanted to say one thing about that though that probably everybody doesn't know is that the Scott store um, is working with us right now on doing a branding program for you to so they're being very open and, you know, to having you on products come in. I mean, obviously they have their business model, so I don't want to tell everybody you're guaranteed in the store, but but we're going to be branding um, probably within the next two weeks. We'll have all the Utah on tags and everything up. Then beyond that, um, we'll, once we get that done and we kind of make sure it's working okay, then we'll move to Park City to the market. And we're just going to start working with Lee's in, in Camas Food Town, the different uh, independents, to start doing that. So as a Utah Zone member, you know, that, that kind of will, as long as you're doing what you're supposed to be doing as far as regulatory, you should be pretty good to get in there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it did kind of cover up the, that spot, but if you have $2 million oh. in general liability, are you asking for specific two million just towards AFS as a specific certificate holder? Is that a separate insurance? No, it shouldn't be a separate. It shouldn't be okay. a separate. Okay, so insurance. just your general liability. <coughs> yeah, your general is fine. liability is fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the differences between moving into AFS versus just DSD is that you'll have to. Um, figure out how you want to participate on like spoils. So there's a spoils allowance built in typically to your cost of goods just to cover damages and things like that. It's it's not significant, it's usually about 1%. Um, so that's that's probably one of the biggest differences and then opt into a reclaim policy. Either your product's not reclaimable and you have good spoils or you're gonna have an authorized reclaim where if it spoils at the store they can return it for credit. All right, so I touched on the vendor agreement that AFS does require. 
Um, it's it's not extremely complicated, but it can be confusing. And so there's a couple of things that we can do to help there. I mean, of course, you know, the line is always open. So you can pick up the phone and call. Um, we can also provide you with like a Cliff Notes version because it is written in legalese, which legalese is legalese, right? Um, so, so that it's easier to understand. Um, but, you know, I reached out and spoke directly with the person who kind of vets these things and looks at them and she said, hey, you know what, I am so much more than happy to have a conversation on the phone and just walk through section by section and explain exactly what everything means. Um, so don't get hung up on the vendor agreement if that's a point of um, concern. On the food safety piece, you know, I mentioned um, on the GMP, you know, where it may or may not, just depending on the risk level of the food. if if our team looks at it and says, oh, you know, um, we just might need a little bit more information, we have a food safety team that will come out and inspect the facility and there's no charge. They'll just come out and take a look at it and make sure that everything's in compliance. Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. I was just putting my hand when you're done. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Um, so they, now they do, um, that, that inspection, I should mention, is specific to AFS, but what they also include in that are some services that um, you may or may not already already have in place. So um, I'm not sure how many of you have like a HACCP plan. So that's if not, that's something that they can come out and help you develop and give you some advice on how to put together and just to make sure does everybody know what that is. No? Okay, so it's a, hold on. I don't gotta make sure I say it right. It's a hazard analysis critical control point plan. So basically what it is, is a, a plan that shows that you have <coughs> measures in place to um, properly produce your food. So as your product is received, it's received at the right temperature. As it's stored, it's at the right temperature, and this is how you know, and these are your regulatory measures as it's produced. This is how you make sure it's at the right temperature during production through each stage of the batch of food you're producing or whatever it is. So it's um, it's nice to have that consulting piece anyway at your disposal if you need it. Um, they also can help you put a reclaim plan together. So if you don't have a plan to properly record batches so that um, as your food is distributed, if something goes wrong, you can have a plan in place to retrace those steps to recall that batch. Um, so those are those are things that AFS can help with. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, this is relevant to what you're saying now. If, if we have uh, organic certification, can you still require this type of inspection, or is it organic certification sufficient for this food safety? No, that's still we'd still require the the inspection. We'd ask for your certification as well, mm -hmm. just so that it's on our books. Mm -hmm. um, but the third party, and there's there's not a lot of difference between. Um, what we'd be looking for for DSD or warehouse. So for DSD, it is a little bit more lenient, but it, it's pretty similar. So you know, you have that under your belt at least for one year. There is a, a recertification um, period after one year, so this would be to help you get started, and then you could go from there. If that makes any sense. Are there any any other questions on that? Who would be the contact person to get that? Going? So um, this this is a process that we would undergo if we were going to put your product in the stores. So this is kind of um, to help you so that you can get through our system to get your product in the stores, if that makes sense. So do you work with people that use commissaries or do we have to have our own facility? No, we work with people that use commissaries. Are there any, any other questions on this piece? Okay. All right. Now this one, um, I don't want this to come across the wrong way because I know you guys all have absolutely amazing products. Um, but sitting on the side of the desk where I see like literally thousands of them, um, I wanted to put together kind of just a little bit of nuts and bolts recommendations on some things that I see and some, um, maybe if you didn't already know, just maybe some little little points to think about, right? Um, so, of course, authenticity about your product, right? That it is what it says it is. Um, 
that should kind of go without saying, I think, but I wanted to put it up there anyway. Um, a family of UPCs, that's just helpful if you're on the front side so that when you do go to make that leap to a bigger distribution, you've, you've already got them included. So just to work that on the front side so that they've got the, does everybody know what I mean by family UPCs? Yeah? No? Okay, so um, you have, say it's a 10 digit UPC, the first five are all going to be identical. And then the differenti differentiating numbers are gonna be on the back side of that. So it's, it's helpful. Anyway, that's how all of our contracts are constructed for our deal entry and everything when we do go into the warehouse. So it's helpful if you secure it up front then you don't have to backpedal and do a package change and all of that. Um, I wanted to touch on brand protection and this kind of goes along with the question of um, the markup in the middle, right? So um, when you put your brand out there, and some of, some of this might be able to go without saying, but um, I'm gonna use a couple examples. <coughs> so General Mills and Procter & Gamble both have what's called map pricing. Are you guys familiar with that term? Yeah, some, some nodding. No? Okay, so it's minimum advertised price, meaning that you cannot go below that price when you advertise their items. There, there are loopholes, and I won't go into, go into the loopholes because it's not the point. The point is when you put your product out there, you should always know your floor, right, so that you don't wind up putting yourself in a, in a situation where it's not profitable to sell it into somebody, even if it's on like a bigger scale. Um, so like say you, you know, and also what, what happens and what we've seen happen is if, the, if you dip to too low of a price, um, then you've got a certain group of consumers, like um, I don't wanna get too far into demographics, but there's some people that really, they're, they're looking for that bargain, right? They're looking for that low price point. And if you dip to too low of a price, they're gonna constantly be looking for that low price point and it can damage how your product moves when it's at, when it's at that higher price. In, long, in the long run. So I would just be careful to make sure that you don't go out there at too, too hot of a price, even if it's like, oh, but this is gonna get my product on the shelf. You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword because you wanna get it out there for trial, but if you put it out there at too low of a price, it can have some negative impact in the long run. Um, all right, and you guys are all, all aware of like the trends and shifting consumers. I think that we kind of touched on that a little bit before where people are looking for, you know, healthier options or, no artificial colors, ingredients, flavorings, things like that. Um, and then there, there are a couple um, tough places to play that I've noticed. So I mentioned that I work with our procurement team wall to wall. There's a, there are a few specific areas that I find myself revisiting those offices pretty frequently. And they look at what I brought them and they're like, you know, this is just, it's really tough because I've seen 25 peanut butters today and you know <laughs> like there there are just a few that if you do choose to go down that road I would I would just suggest figuring out like some different differentiating points about your products you know I put a few examples up there like peanut butter is one of them um, a lot of other things that we see uh, granola honey uh, like nutrition protein bars so I, I actually managed that and I had someone tell me that there are over 2,000 brands out there, and I totally believe it. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Expo West. It's just like plastered with protein and energy bars. So not to say that you can't succeed there because they're absolutely in high demand and growing like crazy, but it's just a little bit more of a tough place to play, let's say. So anyway, any questions there? No? Okay. Well, thank you. If you have any, any questions for me you didn't want to ask of the group, like, please don't hesitate to reach out or Okay, just um, real quickly, uh, what I want to hit on is talking about after you get through the warehouse, then what? And how can you work with our marketing team to help tell your story? Uh, I want to take you through a little bit of um, efforts we've made the, the past few years uh, to be better at local. Um, I will admit up front, I don't think we've been that good to work with in some respects, and I've been trying to be better at it. Uh, about three years ago, uh, AFS and specifically our corporate stores, uh, we worked with a consultant on local produce and wanted to, and that really kind of started our journey on being better at local. Uh, and I'll take you through some of those materials and just so you kind of see, and we want to actually work very, very closely with you. Um, you may have your own marketing materials and if you do, great. If not, 
uh, similar to what Utah Zone offers, we will we will get our our team and our marketing team out to you uh, to work with you to get the information that we need to help tell your story to our consumers. So, and I'll show you some of what that looks like. Um, one one of the efforts that we made about three years ago, we revamped our entire tag program at Associated Food Stores so that we had and you have to keep in mind we work with retailers in all of these states. So when we built the program. Uh, we had to make sure that it worked for all of them. If you have products that you're selling to Associated, we need to get your, uh, all this information you know, through our procurement team so that we can flag them. We actually print all of these tags um, at Associated and ship them out to our stores so they don't have to worry about it. It's way, way easier than trying to uh, do like pop-outs of shelf edge and different materials like that. Um, this is why we did that, is just to take the, you know, the burden off of the store teams uh, so it's, it's all integrated fully into the sign and tag, and when the scan teams go out and hang it, it's there. Uh, but we have to have the information for you so that we can flag it inside of our database. So that's one piece that uh, we'd love to work with you on. And if you're out there today, we just need to get the information from you so that we can flag it in our system. And then we do promote this both in-store and online to help tell this story. And you have to keep in mind, again, we're working with all these different retailers in different states, so we've got to have you know, an official way to do that. But we do support this for our retailers. Um, I want to take you through, so produce is a big effort that we, we dove into, and I want to show you what that looks like. Um, we started this three years ago, and uh, it's first started in Utah, but we've since uh, we've reached out, we're working uh, with uh, producers in um, Idaho, and Montana currently, and are continuing to reach out to um, additional producers in different states, uh, because we know how important this is. This is the data that we have, local produce is the number one thing that our shoppers are looking for uh, that helps signal uh, how fresh a store is, and so that's why we chose to focus on this. And I'll just, I'll take you through a lot of uh, what we've done. The key thing is, is we had to work hand in hand with a lot of these farmers, and I mean, all of you understand, I mean, it's uh, how much work goes behind pulling together a brand. Most of the farmers that we worked with, um, they didn't have photos, high resolution photo, you know, photos that we could use. Uh, they didn't, they never had taken the time to sit down and write their story out about, you know, what their company is, their history. Uh, and so we actually put people out in the field to go out there and do that. Uh, interview them, got our photographers out there to do all of that. So with that, what, what that's looked like is um, we've, over the last few years, we've been putting together um, summer produce events in all of our corporate stores, but this is actually then um, spread out to many of our member retailers as well. We're doing parking lot events uh, paired with in-store marketing, and these are just some of the things that we're helping to produce for them to help tell that local story. Uh, and really, this is all stuff that we'd like to work on with all of you as well. Uh, it starts with our print ads. So we're, we're putting this in the weekly ads uh, every single week during these events. Uh, let's see. Oops. There we go. So then what we did um, for our corporate stores, let me just back up. For our corporate stores, uh, we, we manage all of the marketing for our corporate stores as well. And we made the investment in telling this story in not just stores, but in uh, both traditional and digital media as well. So here I'm going to just show you a few examples. Uh, we, did di we did digital billboards to help tell the story around these events. Uh, you can see just some versions of what that looked like. Uh, we're actually out there, um, if you've done this, uh, Google uh, advertising. So we were out there on digital display. Uh, both, you know, through digital display and video display to help tell these stories out to as many consumers as we possibly could. Um, and then, uh, you know, through email, and I'll cover some of the reach that we have so you can kind of get a sense of why this would make sense for you. Uh, a lot of when we get into these events, you can see here, we're actually taking those stories and sending these, uh, our producers' stories out to hundreds of thousands of people on a weekly basis so they know you know, more about the local farmers. Uh, we invite those farmers to actually come into our parking lot events as well. Uh, social media, let's see, don't have those. Oh, yeah, I do, right there. Maybe it'll play. No, I'll skip over it. Uh, in-store, so again, we made the investment in in-store signage. 
uh, to help tell the stories behind every single farmer that we work with. Uh, you can see the different signs down here on the bottom. These actually go right next to the product uh, down here. Uh, along with in the stores can mark on those signs the price of all the items. Uh, so it's a nice integration there. Uh, we've got these other signs that uh, we've produced uh, that go up during uh, keep the, whatever the farmer's growing season is. Uh, but you can just see here an example of what's happening inside the stores to help tell the story of these producers. Um, different version of it, what it looked like for Macy's. And then I talked about our local farmer events. And so we're making the investment uh, to do this all summer long, every weekend. Where we, we bring in the farmers, we merchandise all of their products uh, alongside. You can see here the, how we're telling the story. And it's been very, very successful for our stores. We've seen year over year increases in these events. And so it's been a very powerful way for us to help tell this story. Um, some additional examples of what this looks like. Um, and then, let's see, stop there. Um, that's, so that just to give you a sense of what we're doing and what we want to do with you, you know, as you're getting into the warehouse or if you're even working directly with some of our retailers, uh, we'd like to partner with you uh, and get this information from you so we can help tell your story uh, with all of our retailers. Yes? Nope. No. Oh. We've invested the time and effort into it because it's, uh, we feel that it's uh, incredibly uh, powerful for us. It's, our customers care about it. We just want to make sure that uh, you know we're working with you. And it's it's going to, I know every single one of you is probably a different situation for what materials you have, what you've built, but we'll, we're happy to work with you in any way we possibly can. So. Any questions on the marketing side? Yeah. So that is something you do once someone's in the warehouse, okay. once someone's in the no, I, or DSD or what? It, once you're in the store and you're working, does it with matter us, if you're just in a couple member stores? Yep. Yeah, we'll help you in yeah, any way we can. So we yeah. who, we contact you. <coughs> I I thought my slides were over, but I'll, I've got a I've got a contact information that you can. You don't want to try to reach out to me. You'll never get a hold of me. But I've got a person that you can reach out to, okay. and we can set up those. Uh, just a couple other examples um, of things that we're doing. So dairy, we're working with all these dairy farmers. These signs are up in all of our dairies. I can see some what we're doing with uh, Oakdale, Cosset, many hit on Cosset. This is one of our most successful uh, partnerships I've ever seen. Uh, they've, uh, they've been one of the best uh, local producers to work with. And you can see here, we worked hand in hand with them to develop signage that uh, you know, they approved of, that are, would work in our stores. Um, with all of our ranchers, and then this is yeah this is the contact information you're looking for. And we'll make sure Lori has this and can send it out. But uh, Sarah, who's on my team, you can work with. I'm obviously Mindy's giving you her information. Uh, Sarah Pettit's uh, the person on my team with marketing that you'd want to reach out to, and she can work with you to get you know gather whatever information you have or set up time for our team to come out uh, and visit with you to gather additional information. Uh, what we're typically looking for, and I, I like maybe hit on high resolution photos, uh, but a lot of it's your stories. We need to know, you know, we want to know more about you, your company, your team. Um, that really, you know, all of the, the story behind your products that you're selling too. I mean, you guys create, you know, some of the best products out there, but we've got to know what that is so that we can help sell it. Um, so that's where we're invested in this and want to work with you on that. So. <coughs> What other questions can I answer? Yeah. Oh, I Here. just noticed the email is AF stores, not AFS. Correct. Stores. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's on one S. Yep. Yes. So, as a local uh, producer, I, and I'm just speaking for myself, I tend to do well with like apartments or yes. foods because people go there yes. and expect to pay more. And as a local small company, we, we just don't have the ban I don't have the bandwidth to yeah. sell there in AFS and compete with the big guys. So I'm wondering if your margins are lower in order to bring in the local companies to keep the prices down. I'm, I don't know about demographics with AFS. If, they're willing to pay as much as like clients. It, it depends. I mean, you speak to this too. I mean, it really depends on the store. Um, we've got uh, some of our newer Macy's stores. I think we've actually done pretty well on some of these items. All of the local produce, none of that's you know what you would consider off-bottom pricing. We've 
then I think pretty fair with those producers and building those partnerships. And then like, I think Lori was hitting on some of those retailers that are really invested in this. Um, yeah, they're, they're charging some of our margins today. Yeah. And I would, I would say, you know, as long as it's consistent, you know, so even if it is whatever format you're in, and if, it, if it's a really high-end product, it may not be a good fit for some of the more value format stores, you know, where a consumer's just not, that consumer probably won't go do their shopping there, you know. Um, but if you're, if you're in the right locations, I wouldn't re reduce your price um, just to try to fit it in better because that's still your brand. Those are still your products, and it, no matter where a consumer goes to find them, you know they they should understand like that's that's just what it costs. You know, and I think the majority of people are if they know that you're a local brand and you've got great product, they're going to pay they're going to pay the money for it. You know. Anything else? Well, and then also to that, and you that what you tell them, I mean, we're, our, our consumer Facebook page is just growing, growing, growing all the time. And we're putting our Instagram. So, you know, you need to remember also that if you get into an AMFS store, then you need to send us information about that, and we'll put it out to on our page to let people know that now you're at the AMFS stores or which stores. You can't, you cannot give us enough content. So don't ever be worried about thinking, I'm, oh my gosh, I'm sending them too much. You can't send us too much. We're, we'll, we will put it out there for you. That's what we're here for. So that's another way that we can help market your product to them. Yeah, and we're perfect. I mean, if you're working with, you know, with Lori and her team, and they're already building content for you, all we need to do is get that you know, from you guys, and we're happy to help share that. Yeah, yeah so we could do that too. So yeah. I think we have, have a good time that way. Yes. I noticed you had a 2D barcode on those labels. Are you going to 2D on most products, or are you still going to have the 1D? You have the shelf signage? Yeah. That's, it's, it's for our in-store ordering um, system. Yeah. As far as I can register, no, that's, we're still using the traditional see. Yes? Um, I'm wondering, you were talking about um, scaling smartly, and and my question for you is, with that scaling will come like probably new manufacturing capabilities. Do you have any relationships with co-manufacturers that might be able to assist with scaling to be able to serve your stores? So we, we directly um, really don't, mm -hmm. but um, you know we do have relationships with other businesses who, who've done it. So if there's like a similar type product, you know, and there would be a network opportunity there, possibly. Mm -hmm. We could we could see if, like, uh, so as an example, like blue chip co-packs lots of products for um, like freeze dried goods, and we have a good relationship with them. So you know, we could say reach out to them and say, hey, can we put you in contact with someone who might be interested in working with you? That that type of a thing. Or if it was a, a similar business that we knew was using a co-packer, we could ask them if they would be open to that type of networking, you know, just to, to help you kind of figure out the best place to go. What we want to, honestly, we want to help any way we can. Um, so if there's an opportunity like that that we can be of assistance, we'd love to. Any other questions? Cool. Awesome. Thanks very much for the opportunity to come speak with you guys. We really, really appreciate your time and you know, just just allowing us to just come and kind of at least give you a starting point on how we may be able to better connect. Thank you. The regulatory people are telling me the meat's been out for two hours. <laughs> so I had to put it away. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's on, just on their mind. <laughs> so that's where I had to go. Um, gosh, thank you so much. And I hope that's been helpful. Um, a couple of 
things that I just wanted to comment on. Um, what is what is the full? Because I know it's different in different stores. What is the cost for products to be on the shelf in AFS stores? I mean, I think we just have to talk about that. I mean, is it different for the product, or I mean, how does that work? It varies. So. Um, even, even up front when we're negotiating slotting, it just depends. So, um, you know, there are conversations around, um, do, does your business have uh, a budget? Do you have a bucket for slotting separately? Because a lot of businesses do. Um, probably not small ones, you know, of, of this nature. Most of them are big CBD companies that really break out their buckets like that. You know, and then also I would say um, we haven't had specific conversation around it, but we, we want to work with you. So if you come, if you are coming into the warehouse and it's like, you know, I just really don't have money for that sliding, we'll work, we'll work with you on it. It's, it's not a deal breaker. Um, another thing I would consider is if you don't have an accrual built into your product, you want to consider adding one. Do you guys know what I mean by adding a cool? A cool? A promotional accrual? Um, so a lot of times you'll take whatever the raw like net net cost of your product is that you're going to sell it for and you add a percentage in there and it just kind of varies on the frequency you want to promote it at and the depth so say it's 10 percent and you're going to promote it at 20 percent off five times a year for one month right or four times a year for one month because you're going to get a lift out of that and you're going to sell more product but what, what building that into your to your cost structure does is it gives you that, that capability of putting that reduced price on your item to create that um, kind of the sale price atmosphere, right? Where it can move a little bit better. Um, so that's just something else to think to think about if you don't have that built into your cost of goods already. On, on the promotional side too, real quick. Um, well, if that's the promotional side is important, we can also help their um, do some things that may not be as expensive. We found a lot of success with giveaways that we can manage for you. So if you want to do like a, a gift basket, and then we go out and run a contest online for you. That's a very affordable way to you know, help draw interest and in awareness of your products without spending much money. The other thing that we've got in place, we have about 90 stores that, that have a rewards program. And that allows us to go out to the consumer directly, and so as an example, let's say you had, you know, pick Mindy's favorite uh, peanut butter, <laughs> but let's say you have a great product and you want to get out there, we could go out there for you, target similar shoppers who are buying competitive products, and go to them directly with an email, so we've got a much smaller audience, and then go with a smaller promotional fund. Uh, so that you're not having to come up with you know thousands and thousands of dollars like a CB CBG is going to do. So that's another area that we can help you leverage, and are more than happy to do that for you. And that's really, you guys. I mean, really, you have to know, you have to know that that's huge. That they're willing to help with that because it is one of the barriers. It has been one of the barriers for a long time with a lot of the AFS stores. Is when you get to the store and you're all excited to get in the store, and then and then they let you know. Okay, well, you've got to pay this much before you can even be in the store, and then you're out. And then I can't speak enough to adding in those margins for promotions and different things. You know, and, and when I started my business, it was 1998. There was not, I didn't know anything. Oh my gosh. I, when I think back, I, I'm just horrified that I even made it this hard. But I didn't know anything. So when I would go sit in front of a buyer and I would say, They'd say, how much, okay, you need to do a promotion four times a year. I just would say yes. And then I'd go back and do the numbers, and I'm losing money every time I do a promotion. Don't do that. Know your numbers. Know how low you can go. And do not be afraid to say when you're sitting with your buyer, I can't go that low right now. Don't be, af don't be intimidated and feel like you have to do whatever they're telling you to do. Don't do that because you won't survive. So when, we, when I stopped manufacturing myself and went to a co-packer, I was able to, to add in all those margins. So I have a 15% margin for um, marketing money. So when I get checks, 15% goes to marketing. You know, then there's, you know, if you have salespeople, whatever, then there's the commission side of it. 
So make sure you build all those in or you'll have a big surprise. The worst thing that could happen is for people to love your product and you can't handle the growth. And one more thing that I just want to say, you guys, have, some of you have heard me say this, who won the race, the tortoise or the hare? Yeah, so take your time. Don't think you have to be big fast because it's not all that it looks like it is. So, um, and then the last thing is, a lot of, one of the problems that comes up a lot for Utah Zone is that when they get in front of a buyer to, to or, or let's say they get with Smart Distributing or on the dot, um, then they're approved and then everything stops. And they can't, who do they talk to? They don't get called back. So now they're all excited that they're approved, but then nothing happens and it just sits. So what, I mean, what's the suggestion with that? How do you, I realize that there's different personalities with people and some people are more local than others, but how, that's a frustration that um, I'm trying to figure out how to, how to get around, or, is, or can we? Is it just up to the buyer? Um, once, I mean, once the product gets approved and is, is in, um, then that's, that's essentially authorization that, I mean, if you, if you want to actually go in and like check on the store and say, you know, we're supposed to have X product in X place and it's not there, then you should be able to have a conversation um, even inside the store. Just a per store? Well, that, I mean, when, when you say approved and it's in there, I think that that's kind of maybe a little bit, a little bit gray. So there are different, there are different avenues of approval, right? Like, um, were you approved just to go into, like, say, two stores? Okay. Or were you approved um, to go into the system and you're in a planogram? Because if your product gets on the shelf in a planogram and we have it built into our software and it's literally schematic for it, we have, I think it's like 175 stores that participate in that, and they've agreed to follow those sets within a 5% variance. And knowing that, I and mean, we, we actually appreciate retail work. We appreciate people making sure that their products are on the shelf where they're supposed to be because you don't approve an item unless you think it's a good item and you, you want it to succeed and you really want to give it a shot. So if that's the case and you're approved and you're in those planograms, then it's actually appreciated to go in and check on those sets and make sure that the product's where it should be. So that's kind of what I would recommend there. If you're, if you're paying, uh, or if your product's in with the distributor, like uh, on the dot or smart, then they've got, they've got retail work that can do that, right? Mm -hmm. Like they should be servicing the stores and making sure that your product's where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I'd kind of just depend depending on the level of approval and, and where your products at. There are certain things you can do to make sure that it's in the store how how it was agreed upon on the front. So if you are using a distributor to get in the store mm -hmm. and nothing's happened, is that is the distributor the stop? Or I mean, if if the distributors come back to you and said, okay, you know, you're good to go and then nothing happens. Is that, the, is, is that the distributor or the person at AFS? I, th I think it just goes back to how it was approved. Okay. Right, because sometimes um, off-shelf is a little bit more difficult to manage than mm -hmm. if it's in a planogram. Yeah. Um, and so I think it would be just kind of defining like, okay, okay. so how was it approved? <clears throat> like, was it approved to go up on a special display? Was it approved to go into a set? Like what? What was the the merchandising okay. avenue? So find that out first, and that, then that's the route. Okay, I would probably go. Okay, and then because um, there's always got to be there's got to be a touch point on the other side of how that product's going to end up in the store. Right, right, right. An execution plan, and then once that's understood, it's <coughs> easy to connect the dots and figure out where okay. the wheels fall off the bus. Right. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say um, is. Mandy was so, is so right, and this is a recent experience that I had with my product. Um, I lowered my price, so my chips used to be on retail at 369 because they were, you know, gourmet, handmade. Well, as we've gone through the years, you know, I've brought that price down, got, the bag's gotten bigger, more family-friendly kind of thing. So I lowered my price um, so that it could hit 250, 249 on the shelf. Well, 
a distributor that I was using, local distributor I was using, got, you know, wanted to move that product. So they went down to $2 a bag on the shelf. And they did it so often that I, I can't recover from that. So Mindy, I mean, that's really true. And again, don't be afraid to speak up. You know, you know your product. I mean, you know, it, it, it's really true that if it gets too low, people will expect it to, if, then when the price goes up, they're gonna say, well, why should I pay that? So just be careful, don't devalue your product and what you're doing to put it in. You're still a local product and people have the mentality with a local product that they are gonna pay a little bit more. So don't, don't be, again, don't be intimidated or afraid to, to hold your ground when you have to, when there's a certain amount of money that you ha have to have to function. Um, so yeah, that's just my own experience. Well, I think too, there's something to be said for placing value on your product by having a higher price point. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not even kidding. When I went, when I moved my price point up two dollars, I started selling more. So, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you really have to know, and that's market. You got to get out there, and you got to get a feel for it. You got to see how it's working in the stores. What's what is a competing product at, on the high end, and what are they? What's a competing product on the low end? And Feel it out and see, but it, it, you know, that's why, honestly, that's why when I have new vendors come in, I always say do farmer's market for a couple of years because that is your best, you know, like, how many of you do farmer's market? A lot of people have done farmer's market for a long time. It's your best market. test market to get out there and see, is my price too high? Why aren't people buying this? Do they not like how it tastes? Is it, I mean, that is, before you go in and start investing a lot of money into keep filling stores, make sure that people like your product first. And you have a perfect, our, our farmer's markets here are so well attended. We have more than we've ever had. Uh, the community is just supporting them so well. So, so use that, uh, you know, don't, don't put out the big bucks yet. Make sure you know, I always say to people, it's great, you know, your best, the best thing that could happen is for you to fail fast. And what I mean by that is, if you're going to do farmers markets and it's not going to happen, you want to know then, not before you put money into a kitchen, right? <coughs> so, um, okay. Anybody? No, just, just one quick comment to go along with what Laurie was talking about about price. Having a floor on your pricing isn't going to be foreign to a buyer. That we we see that. You know, people will come in and say, "Do not take my brand below this retail." Mm -hmm. You know that that happens. So it's anyway. Just uh, <coughs> wanted to make the point that you're not going to be speaking a foreign language when you say that or come across the wrong way. It's perfectly fine to put a floor on your on your pricing. Any other questions from anyone? Comments? Um, uh, Mindy and I are going to be kind of working together on the AFS show. You know, Utah Zone used to have a section um, there where people could come in and have a little spot. Um, there were some issues with that, which is why we haven't been doing it, but Mandy and I have been working through that, and we're going to try to figure out a way that is been really beneficial for you to be there if you want to be there. So watch for that, kind of, you know, as it gets closer to the time. Um, and then the last thing is, I hope everybody can attend on November 29th in the evening here, 6 to 9. We're having an appreciation dinner. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to think about anything. You just have to come and enjoy the night, the evening, and we just want to—we just want you to know how much we appreciate you. We want to treat you a little bit, and and kind of tell you some of the things that we're doing this next year. We have some really big, exciting things coming, um, so we want to share that with you. So if you can make it, we'd love to have you. We're going to be giving away some little gifts, and um, and again, you know, I I can never get through this sentence without getting all teary, but. I am so I, I get so honored to stand in a room <clears throat> with people like you because you are the people who make things happen you are the people who have courage you are the people who are brave and it's not easy to get out in front of store buyers and different people and have you know have to put your heart out on the table essentially because it's your creation right so um, I just want you to know that when you come to these, I know how valuable your time is. Nina and I are, and the whole team are working really hard to make sure that when you're here, it's worth your time. 
So I hope that you will continue to come. We have lots planned coming up. So just watch, be sure and open your emails. I have a hard time when somebody says, oh, I didn't see it. And we're trying to hit everything we can, Facebook, email, whatever it is, so you know what we're doing. So thank you for coming there.